I can be calm. They got all their cameras for the end of the day today, and I walked into my friend's time out of the Human Resource Center panel, Dr. Alexander Lemon, is a research fellow in the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a co-director of the forthcoming CSIS report, The Potential Foreign Policy and National Security Implications of Global Climate Change. Dr. Andrew Bryce Smith is an assistant professor of political science at Colorado College, director of the Project on Health and Global Affairs, and author of the book, The Health of Nations, Infectious Disease, Environmental Change, and Their Effects on National Security and Development. Dr. Kent Hugh Butts is professor of political and military strategy and the director of national security issues at the U.S. Army's War College Center for Strategic Leadership. Welcome to all of you. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. It is also the practice of the subcommittee to take testimony under oath. Do you have objections to be sworn in? You also have the right to be represented by counsel. Is anyone represented by counsel for today's hearing? Please stand and raise your right hand. I swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, Mr. Lennon, you may be seated. Please be seated.
last week, I was asking about the different classes of cities and distractions that have been stable society. Uh, and the stabilization is like the pathogen specific. Uh, and there is at least one opinion that South Africa, Southeast Asia, Sub Saharan Africa, and portions of Latin America. Uh, the effects of uh, U.S. national security are by opinion of global primarily the developed. Um, that disease can act as a stretching to block weaken states uh, to radicalize populations and to manifest facilitate. So, uh, and some that much more extreme is actually required in this way to declare a movement of exploration prior to the disease to be accounted for both the locals and uh, the family of the permanent population. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. You kind of have an interesting perspective. Uh, I don't think we told them to talk about stamps because I understood the schools and so I think that we can spin this off to Google this. So, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Max. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for allowing me to contribute to your work and uh, the Committee on Investigations in Wellness. The relationship between climate change and security is important. However, the play may be able to define the future vitality of the world. The main item of focus at the moment is the Department of Defense. In addressing climate change and security issues, and in particular, highlight the value. Sovereign nation capacity to build data and to stabilize it. Climate change demands. The proactive approach includes allowing the Delta Man to figure the damage on the command and the leaders do not represent the views of the U.S. Army or College or of the United States Army or the Department of Defense or any other established institution. While the debate continues on the causes of climate change, significant consensus for addressing the security dimensions already exists. Many opportunities for alliance and partner cooperation to, while issues of major significance to regional security. Security can be the still coming to grips with some security issues in general and climate change in particular. For years, security studies focused on personal force issues and reflecting the Cold War era. New definitions take time to form constituencies, terms such as environmental security, economic security, human security have different stakeholders and require different approaches to the security debate. Climate change is an environmental security issue and should be considered in that context. Environmental security refers to a, quote, process whereby solutions to environmental problems contribute to national security objectives. While the relationship of environmental issues to security was recognized previously at the end of the Cold War, while it did exist national dimensions of security, the recognition that environmental issues could inflame existing tensions into conflict, but could also serve as complex global measures to ease tensions. Cato's principle of one strategic mindset made this clear. Risks to security are less likely to result from calculated aggression, but rather from the adverse consequences of instabilities faced by many countries. Security and stability at political, economic, social, and environmental levels, as well as the indispensable economic defense dimension. Climate change affects the management of these elements. And the end is a threat multiplier for instability in the most of the volatile nations of the world. In the post-Cold War era, then, instability is the chief threat to U.S. national security interests. Soft security issues like these have, been, have the potential to destabilize regions and become hard security issues which require the intervention of combat forces and threaten U.S. security interests. The security dimensions of climate change could be characterized as having three elements, global, geopolitical, and regional. If you look at the 2006 Quadrennial Defense Review of the Department of Defense, it states that the transformed vehicle seeks to take preventive action to solve preventive health crises. This should be the U.S. approach to climate change and security. It involves all elements of national power. Army defense is a military element of national power. 
Jim's support band being able to contribute to security relations at each level. Via that, it reduced its energy consumption and carbon emissions. It can encourage technological research, development, and energy conservation, clean fuels, and alternative energy. It can prepare for military responses to new climate predictive realities such as competition for Arctic resources. It can proactively work with regional capabilities and alliances to create climate change resilience and preserve regional stability. These missions make sense as a result of major source savings from energy, waste disposal, and combat arms and deployments. However, DOD should not assume the climate change responsibilities of other agencies. These agencies should be properly resourced and directed to assume their climate change missions. While the ongoing National Intelligence Estimate and Military Advisory Board summaries of the threat to security are pressing, need to be heard. The question should be asked, where is DOD possibly involved in solving environmental security issues? Where are U.S. national security threats evident? What resources should be brought to bear? And how should the Department of Defense be working with other agencies to do that? If we put those questions in our national security strategy, it may, su- it may suggest answers to those questions that delineate which agencies will do what, that DOD strategic documents will address climate change, and we will have the best minds that are addressing security nationwide, addressing the security of the region, and we will preserve the vitality of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I do have some questions. I, I hear very interesting testimony, and I'd like to talk to you further about the work that you're doing. Um, but so I guess the questions are how clear are you? Are the multinational structures for cooperation that we have in place adequate to meet the scope of the challenges? Are we facing a moment in the not too distant future when new institutions will be needed? Does the time come when we should be thinking about designing and creating things that are thinking? Where do we want to be? Where do we want to be? Answer, please. I think that's what the thing is. I think we have the institutions in place that we need to work with on that. It's a matter of assigning a priority and then resources. That's not to say that for most security issues we should have a uh, email compendium of our security apparatus. But in terms of dealing with this issue, from my perspective, I think we can go a long way at solving many of these problems. But the one I would say that's in the realm of the state and aspects of this are in creating the needs of the resources, institutional resources in the right place. Um, I don't know the answer to this one. Um, I would say I'm a little more political than both of you are. Um, I don't think that global uh, institutional structures and institutions are adequate uh, to deal with the issue at this point in time. Um, and the analogy would be looking at the global HIV AIDS epidemic, which has ravaged virtually uh, the world in the last few years and continues to this day. Um, and there's a lot going on with HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, the human AIDS epidemic is very rosy picture for me. But in fact, when you take the data and crunch it and, and look at it, the epidemic continues to expand in St. David and East Asia, certainly in uh, Russia and the former Soviet republics, and um, others to the point as well. So even though there's been some decline in HIV AIDS, it's not, it's not terrible. In fact, it continues to expand. Malaria is not under control whatsoever. Deadly fever is, is restricted right now by temperature gradients, so that is being affected as well. But it may expand. And I'm very concerned about the lack of funding for the WHO, the World Health Organization. I'm very concerned about the lack of human capital within that organization. I think that organization has suffered historically from some rather poor leadership and decision making. I'm not going to be a bad political party today, um, per se, but I, I have my two 
things on this point, and uh, so I think that the United States is particularly important in needs to truly reassess uh, the domination of it and the rise of it and kind of augment its capacity to deal with some of the changes that are facing the world. Well, to answer that, uh, I just want to follow up on your answer. Um, how would you organize it? What do you think it needs to be? And yet, because of his successes, he was also a relative of the moment of that position. Uh, and of course, part of what has exploded uh, out of sub Saharan Africa back into South Asia, I think, largely as a result of that. So I, would, I, I think it has gotten such uh, a snapshot in the data uh, to look at that type of reorganization. And if the progress is as fast as we seem to be, we can do so in the data. to happen is that uh, it's associated with one of the major conditions of sea surface temperature. 
testimony the defense department has no overarching directive or policy guidance that directs the end of the organization to address the security threats of climate change or act to mitigate its effects. It says to me that the department has applied no strategic thinking to how to deal with the problem of climate change or that climate change may provoke. If so, what steps in your view could be taken to better this case? This morning I think of it as the fact that I thought that uh, the liquid waves that uh, the Department of Defense were acting to take on on climate change would be a heavy and tougher conclusions than they came to. However, and uh, I've been on the sites of that defense science group and studied the issue intensively for a while, and so I can kind of demonstrate that there's no stopping going on climate change. If you look at the work of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for the installations on the bottom of Mr. Kim Magistrate on sustainability, and we have worked with them to reduce energy consumption uh, and, uh, and provide the use of scarce resources in an efficient fashion. But most of these efforts have been driven by economics and national security. We have stability, some unstable sources of energy supply, uh, you know, reducing expenditures on energy and the needs to help provide energy for our tax base is the most carrying supplies of fuel to the pump. Uh, what's missing is an overarching uh, set of guidelines that tell all elements of the Department of Defense to examine the security dimensions of the climate change phenomenon and uh, apply it to them. And if it's going to reflect the national security strategy and the dimension so, the Department of Defense will, uh, will address that through its own strategic documentation, and we can get a greater return on investment. It's being done in a decentralized fashion. It may not do any harm, it may affect the enemy. It doesn't go by uh, the worst of all possible on about the level of the most bad thing. And uh, I think that the case can be made. I wanted to just ask a follow up question here. Is there is the Department of Defense, like you talk about that they have done something in terms of global climate change, and has there been sort of an overall directive in terms of a pair of all the things that you've been doing to make your program more energy effective? Um, we would hope that the argument is that when they could be uh, I know that the um, vehicles you have practically uh, cut down on fuel use and Gas. Um, but has there, is there a department or uh, people at the top level saying we have to do this? Not that I know of. I don't know. And I think uh, that it would be a good idea. I just realized it. And I think that it takes a certain amount of time for that. Well, there's uh, no strategic issues to take on in the security community. Uh, I can only point out that this is a, the focus of the security dimension of climate change is the dread of this. Right. Uh, the CNN uh, military advisory report uh, that, that uh, uh, John Solomon chaired uh, was on it, brought out the, the big idea of climate change and security as a compelling issue. So these are drivers that have the attention of people in key leadership positions. So that they will be able to consider and apply it across the board. But at this point, to my knowledge, there isn't anything that speaks to climate change or the overarching focus of the Department of Defense. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Knight, the draft of the chapter by John Podesta and Peter Ogden, on which your testimony concentrates, is part of the NAVAL book that aims at the greenhouse gas emission scenario of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. A scenario that includes massive heat and water shortages, devastating natural disasters, and deadly disease outbreaks. The draft chapter further states that there is no foreseeable political or technological solution that will enable us to avert the majority of the climate impacts projected 
and we act in six sense scenario. This is so why are we doing this thing? Where do we get? As you mentioned, the uh, one of the things I'm based on here is in the film focused on Mario Bond and the consequences of the next thirty years. And that time in the direction of Mario action and the scientists that work with the team. One of the things that surprised me was their advice that essentially over that period of time, we know what is likely to come out. It could be even worse than that. If you look at the negative, the positive feedback that's been on for some of the people, particularly when I spoke about this morning. Um, I think it's likely that there will come out of it. Um, based on the science coming in, one of the sort of flashes of enthusiasm that we found in our study was that a lot of the national security regime was frustrated with how cautious the scientific community was on this. And I think what was somewhat ironic was that a lot of the scientific community gave them definitive answers that some of the officials in the government were required to have staff to gain imperfect information, which is what the national security community was used to doing. The scientific community didn't have that pressure. They didn't face that. That, I think, was the presumption behind the rest of our data. I don't want to speak for them, but behind their assessment that it was inevitable and that it may be even worse than the IPCC assessment because of the natural cautiousness built into the scientific community in a consensus driven process, as opposed to those in the national security community that are used to working with incorrect information and want to know what to do with it. Now, if there's any question you want to do about it, frankly, that's beyond the scope of what we did in the project. We essentially peeled off the front end and let it sort of play out as it was doing. Um, but it did raise consequences that quite concerns the national security community in the way that the project. Um, was designed to try and raise the issues that were interested in being dealt with rather than what's in the record is what the importance of it. Dr. Bressman, for the policy measures you cite that was designated, uh, I think there's another policy measure you would cite that was designed to address the reverse climate change itself. That can help forestall or mitigate the effects of the changes in disease, incident, and prevalence that are uh, likely to result from this. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. What, uh, what can we do in terms of policy? Um, if I can, before I answer that, if I can return to the black question for a minute, which um, I know I can post it because it's important to me. Um, I've been thinking about the role of water in that. There's, there's considerable debate in that coming out of Bangladesh. You know, what, the, what the scientific epidemiologists and the scientific community has been doing is using a more legal set of observations and facts to model the long-term climate change and to try to create a deployment mechanism to measure you know, these short-term changes and try to project from them the impacts on infectious disease. And what, um, what the Army has really found is that in Bangladesh, a lot of diseases in fact social changes. Similarly, in Beirut, um, there's evidence as well that autoimmune uh, diseases and other um, intestinal diseases respond to changes in winter temperatures. And um, again, again, this is a very nascent field, and I'm a political scientist, so to take your line of uh, speaking on those issues, but um, as the evidence accumulates, we'll be able to provide you with far better answers as to um, how these things can be correlated. Now, what I can actually propose in terms of a policy measure is A, we need to establish these empirical means. Uh, are these empirical means, in fact, generalizable around the world? To do that, what might need to happen is that Congress or another you know, body might, might establish a task force on this issue where they actually go out and measure um, these changes in epidemiological indicators such as vectors. And we see that around the formation of interdisciplinary team researchers, including epidemiologists, economists, political scientists, and so forth, to see all right, how do these changes occur and what are the consequences in a short span of time for those territories. And we could do that. In terms of policy measures, once we've established that, in fact, these correlations can work over, over the globe, um, should there be a certain to reply to what it is. 
measures, I think that funding is a enabler and it's an issue to be able to play with it. It's like malaria and then the fire crisis and so forth. Um, it was excellent that she, she continued to have static during the war. So I definitely think that. And um, in, in general, I, I think that uh, the U.S. federal government needs to be more cognizant of the role that disease plays in instability throughout the world. If you look at a milk report that there's a the projection there about the clear blue and others, um, that most of the industrializations of the world happened in the 1800s and early 1900s. The amount of trouble that produced. And as many of the historians of public health have argued, such as Arthur Clark and Ray Bruner and others, that the events of very much of the global warming of disease that have helped us and not only the economic um, underdevelopment of those societies. Thank you. 
out of his child to make him a supreme head of the Lord of his enemies. Thus the Israelites were led unto the land of Canaan, which is the land of Terry and the Lord. And it was a sea of great life, saying the land of the Lord, and of the Persians by sight that was full of so many desert. Wherefore, to the prisoners that were part of the United States to come back to the land of Egypt, and of the Egyptians. So the Pacific Command, for example, was developed to help in the actual planning and organization of such an event that had drafted both the uh, original thinkers to, to draft a multinational disaster response that so few of those with these types of issues. And then through their exercises and their global work, for example, they started to try to get on a track against those who were so heinous and reinforce them. Uh, by focusing the uh, guidance from the Department of Defense to those who were providing commanders on these types of issues, but uh, putting warnings there that the commanders were to ignore, uh, we in fact strengthened those regional organizations and strengthened the military ultimate power within many of these developing countries that used what is almost in our ways the best resource agency within those governments to address that humanitarian potential of, of a climate change or other natural disasters. I, I, I would like to, uh, to, to ask us what that was sort of a different question. Uh, uh, sorry, the third question. Yeah, but, um, uh, one thing that I think we might also do in terms of policy measures is that we might focus on social intervention and not necessarily technical intervention. Now, in this society, we have a proclivity to focus on technological superpowers, so big sensors and big vaccines and so forth, when the reality is human infectious agents across the world, um, we might want to look at social relationships and changing patterns of behavior, uh, particularly in terms of dealing with viruses. The reason being that viruses don't respond to uh, antibiotic drugs, as we all know. And so, um, a historical example comes from the 1918 influenza. Uh, I think we did a lot of work on this, and, and one of the best ways of dealing with pandemic influenza is not to go hunting for a vaccine or to rely on health care and flu, but rather to engage in what we call social distancing. In other words, don't touch your people, don't go hang out with neighbors, do not go to colleagues, and so forth. Uh, I'm sorry, Pinocchio, and one of the best social measures that existed at the time was, in fact, the civil defense associations that had been formed in response to the war, the First World War. And those civil defense associations who went out and actually met with people and to deal with the pandemic on a grassroots level. Now, similarly, you might say, okay, well, in terms of malaria, we have the Grand Vaccination, uh, various other forms of prophylaxis. One thing that this tells me is there is a political focus upon technical engineering when it comes to dealing with global health issues. And there is almost never a serious focus upon developing social measures and social scientists in terms of dealing with issues of contagion. And I think that really needs to be a focus point at the end. Our question, I want to thank all of our witnesses who did a terrific job and again for me as a little different perspective on what we're doing here. Appreciate all of your time. It uh, changes in our lives rather than Africa to think in that term. These are real contemporary things that our witnesses suggest are a real foreshadowing of what the world will become uh, over the coming century. The witnesses have articulated the threats very clearly. We have offered some suggestions for action uh, that have the opportunity for the mitigation of global warming. But this is just to start. We need to be better, and we need to better understand the whole range of global warming consequences. We also need to work harder to build support for positive steps. Again, thank you for your time. I hope you will continue to engage with the committee and with Congress. I think we have a lot to offer, a lot to contribute, and hopefully we will see some changes here. So again, thank you.